So Steve, you more than anyone else are really the architect of what's called life history theory. What got you into that? What's that all about? I was frustrated as a grad student by the dominance of genetic thinking in evolution and the reductionism to changes in gene frequencies. And I wanted to know what was it about the way organisms interacted with their environment that determined um, how fit they were. And, and by fit you mean how many I, children, how many I'm, offspring they have? I mean, in George Williams' classical phrase, how are organisms designed by natural selection for reproductive success in the face of the many ecological problems that they encounter and social problems. Mm -hmm. So life history theory is a general framework that looks at whole organism traits such as age and size and maturity, number and size of offspring. So age and size and maturity, number of offspring at a time probably. Number of offspring at a time, but also how many times does one reproduce over the course of a lifespan? Once, how many? Fre how frequently? How, how frequently? Often? And therefore, because of trade-offs, how long do we live? So it's all connected. All of these different aspects of the reproductive strategy and how long you live. They're all connected to each other, and that means that we tend to see things in nature that are small and have short lives and many offspring, and things in nature that are large and have few offspring and have long lives. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not exact, but there are tendencies, strong tendencies in those directions. Fascinating. So an oyster, 50 million offspring or some crazy number? At least 50 million, maybe why, 100 million. Why not just make 100 good ones? Right, or my, why not make one or two good ones like right. we humans do, or right. like an elephant does. Right, so right? that's all life history theory. That's all life history theory. So why theory. do oysters make 50 million? They have uh, a lifestyle where they have larvae that disperse, and those larvae are going out into highly unpredictable circumstances and into an environment where they are encountering very high risks of getting eaten. And so to make sure that just one or two get through, the oysters have to make 100 million. So out of the 100 million, let's say, how many on the average survive? Two. Oh, that's kind of sad. Poor oysters. Mother Nature is a mean old witch. Someone once said that. Uh, someone once did, and got in trouble for it, too. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, so are there other life history traits we should be aware of, other than these ones about strategies for reproducing and lifespan? Well, the I mean, body weight, for instance, are there other things? That oh, so, well, to? certainly, I said age and size at age maturity, size, but okay. entire, you could think of the entire growth curve or the different stages of maturation as being life history traits. Humans have added a stage of childhood into the ancestral life history, things like mm -hmm. that. Those are very interesting developmental processes that are strongly related to life history theory. Also, uh, something that life history theory teaches us is that there are trade-offs that occur between generations. Hmm. In other words, things that happen in parents influence things that happen in offspring. How does that work? Well, it can work in other organisms, uh, basically through the transfer of molecules and energy in the egg or in the maternal nutrition or things like that. Of course, in humans, we have a long period of childhood learning and, and so forth, during which that can be transferred. And what it leads to is a picture of integration of these effects in groups of organisms. So life history theory actually extends beyond thinking just about how should a single organism live its life into given everything that might happen to my children or grandchildren, how should I live my life? Because it will have these long-term consequences. That's fascinating. Mm.